Welcome to the podcast of Grace Community Bible Church. We hope and pray that you are blessed, challenged, and inspired by this message. For other sermons or more information, visit us at gracebiblechurch.org.au. As I was preparing this message, I stood upon um, the shoulders of uh, many godly dead preachers who preached um, about the, this message uh, men as Jonathan Edwards, Charles Spurgeon, and Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones. So, in this simple message, I'm not bringing anything new. I'm just sharing with you what I have studied of all truths that were buried, and now I'm just bringing back from 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 the dead. I, I love old truth, and I, I trust that you do too. I titled this message "Near but Lost." Near but lost. Nothing is more important in life than for one to be in the kingdom of God. We know that. There's no kingdom that is more glorious, more worth seeking after than the kingdom of God. All other kingdoms will collapse and they will turn into rubble except for the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is an everlasting kingdom. It is a splendorous kingdom. The Bible tells us in Romans 14, 17, that the kingdom of God is of righteousness and peace and joy and the Holy Spirit. Jesus described the kingdom of God to be priceless treasure, a pearl of great price. The kingdom of God is where salvation and peace with God are, are found. And Jesus commands us all, And his command is very clear, and that is to seek his kingdom above all else and at any cost. The question for today is, are you in the kingdom, my friend? Are you in the kingdom or are you outside? Where are you with respect to the kingdom of God? It doesn't matter who you are or where you come from. God is calling you this morning to be in his kingdom. Just a quick background before we dive into today's passage. Mark 12, the day, it's Tuesday Passion Week. Few days just before Jesus would be crucified. Location, it's the temple And at that time, it is filled by thousands of pilgrims that come from the four corners of Israel to celebrate the Passover feast. And there, in the heart of the temple, religious leaders, they hated Jesus so much and they interrogated him publicly so to put a trap for him, hoping that somehow that they put him to death. And they tried to do that by asking questions. Very selected questions, very particular questions, hoping to catch him at his words. And they would be thinking, oh, if he would just say the words that we want him to say, we will turn the crowd and the Romans upon him and he'll be gone forever. But the all-wise Jesus, he exposed their hypocrisy in his answers. And they walked away defeated. They walked the walk of shame. And as they were walking, they threw before Jesus a scribe to ask him that one last question, hoping once again to to trap him, just to say a word. And then they would use this word to bring an end to his life. Now, what is a scribe? A scribe is someone who is, according to the scripture in many different places, is a lawyer. He knows the law of God back to front. If there's anyone that knows God's law, it's the scribe. The scribe back then were like the uh, photocopiers of today. They were responsible on, on, on writing manuscripts and they would have had to know the law of God off by heart to do that. And this is where we pick up our narrative. We'll be reading from verse 28 to verse 34, but I'll make it simple for you. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. We'll just look at verse 34 um, as the highlight of the passage, but we'll read from 28. This is where we pick 
the narrative from. And verse 28, and I'm reading in Nasby, one of the scribes came and heard them arguing, heard the religious leaders and Jesus arguing and recognizing that he had answered them well. Asked him, what commandment is the foremost of all? And Jesus answered, the foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than this. Verse 32 The scribe said to him, right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one and there is no one else besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, and here is the text of today's message that we need to pay attention to, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one ventured to ask him any more questions. We know that there are thousands of unbelievers have faulty GPS, spiritual GPS. There are masses of people that are self-deceived. And they check their spiritual location and then they tap themselves on their shoulders and they say, yes, we think we're in the kingdom. Hallelujah, brother. Praise the Lord. We're in the kingdom. When in reality... As Jesus said to the scribe, they're just near the kingdom, but they're completely out. And when Jesus said to the scribe in verse 34, you are not far from the kingdom of God. It is like Jesus was speaking from the traffic control headquarters of heaven. And he was giving a self-deceived scribe who most likely thought he was in the kingdom simply because he was a scribe. And we would have called Abraham, Father Abraham. And so Jesus here gave him his exact proximity to the kingdom of God. You are not far from the kingdom. Meaning, Mr. Scribe, you're heading the right direction. You're almost there. Your feet are touching the borders of the kingdom. Your hands are groping on the doorknob of the kingdom. But, You're not in yet. You're only near the kingdom, but you're not in the kingdom. Meaning, Mr. Scribe, you're still in a very dangerous disposition. And you must come all the way and place both of your feet into the kingdom. So watch out. Hey, Mr. Scribe, be on high alert. You're in a very terrible situation. Why? Because to be near the kingdom is to be entirely out of the kingdom and that is death to your soul. The outline for today's message is simple once again. We'll just keep it to three points. Not far, but not safe. Why? Not safe. Because you're not in, not in. So we'll start with not far. Again, we look back at verse 34. And Jesus, it says, when Jesus saw that he answered, what? Intelligently. He said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. Intelligently, meaning this cry, his brain was switched on. He wasn't a ball. Jesus told him, well done. You're in the right direction. You're not there just yet, but you're not far. You're pretty close. 
uh, tens of thousands and even millions of people, even here in Australia, who they walk with their back to the kingdom of God and their faces are watching and heading towards the blazing fire of hell. And they say, well, we don't care about the kingdom of God. Don't tell tell us about the kingdom of God. But not this scribe. He's at the outskirt of the kingdom. He's roaming around the gates. Yes, his heart is unregenerate. His eyes um, are blinded. But he's in a good proximity to the kingdom of God. And there's a good lesson for us all to learn. Why? Because what makes this scribe so close to the kingdom of God? I want to give you a couple of answers why he is so close to the kingdom of God and may we learn from him and and study it and be like him in that regard to those who are not in the kingdom yet. Look what what he does. Look at verse 32. He front loads his response to Jesus with amazing exclamation. The scribe said to him, Right teacher. Spot on teacher. You know what is going on here? Number one, this man is truth seeker. He's interested in the truth. To say right Jesus is to say excellent. What a beautiful answer. I couldn't think of a better answer, Jesus. So what Jesus said, he he impressed it upon his heart. He liked it. It was good. And he was honest about it and he admitted it publicly. Because if you think about it, before multitudes of people, before the crowd, he applauded Jesus, clapped for him, said, well done. And, and what was it that made him glad? Look what he adds. He adds this, you have what? Truly stated. You've spoken truth. Meaning every other answer would have been wrong. It would have been a lie, except for what you said. And what was it that he said? That he is one and there is no one else besides him. Of course, he seeks the truth. And the truth is God is more important than anything else. So it seems that this man has commitment to the truth. He has high respect for the truth. When the rest of his peers, the the religious Uh, leaders were caught up in their lies. What did they do when Jesus confronted them with the truth? They walked away with a walk of shame. They were displeased, disappointed. But when they threw this scribe before Jesus, so to debate him and to discredit Christ, what did this scribe do when Jesus spoke truth to him? He didn't walk away like the rest. Instead, he publicly confessed that Jesus was right. So this man was a truth seeker. He wasn't interested in winning debates like the rest were. He was interested in truth. And so Jesus commended this man. Jesus was saying to him, because you sought the truth, you're not far from the kingdom. Why? Because Jesus said, where else in in John 8, 32, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. How is it the truth will make you free? Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. And so when you seek the truth, who are you seeking? You are seeking Christ, who happens to be the king of the kingdom of God. And if that is you, friend, if you're unconverted and you are seeking the truth, I want to encourage you, as Jesus did, encourage this scribe. And I would say to you, you're not far from the kingdom of God. Some unbelievers say, God has not regenerated my heart. What should I do? What do I do about this? Keep seeking the truth. That's all you can do. You cannot be any closer to the kingdom of God than to continue to sit under hearing the word of truth. Because that's the only thing that could ever set you free. The truth. 
Another thing that we can observe here that, as a reason why Jesus commanded this scribe is that he understands the priority of worship. How important is it for all of us to understand this priority of worship? All of us. Verse 33. It says, and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. This scribe understood the heart of worship to God is far more sacred than all ceremonial laws, all offerings, all traditions of man put together. This man majored on the major and minored on the minor. He placed first things first. All false religions, they put so much emphasis on external worship and outward rituals, and yet they overlook the heart that must be given entirely to God. And even much like them, there are those that may come to church like this one and hear a message like this message. But all that they're concerned about is what people think of me. Do people love me? What am I dressed like? And how organized and neat the sermon is. And I love to cross every T and dot every I and all the doctrines. And they give all that much more weight and attention to these things over and above their heart devotion toward God. And these people, no matter what they think, Where they are, they are way too far from the kingdom. Not this man. This man is moving ever closer to the kingdom of God. He understands that to love God with all her heart, the understanding and the strength is infinitely more important than to understand even all the doctrines of the scripture. And do we understand this? Are we convinced in the essentiality of the priority of the inward worship towards God? That to give the entirety of our being to God is a sum and total of all the doctrines and all the law. All externality of worship. It's not that they're not important, but they just happen to be the means to express our love and devotion as well as to grow in our love and devotion to God. But in no way is external worship is more important than yielding one's life without any reservation to God. Do we agree with this? Do we agree that the law of God bids us to love God? And as it says in verse 33, and it is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Friend, if you agree with this, you're not far from the kingdom. You're not far. That's the first point. But you're still not in the kingdom. And if you're not in the kingdom, guess what? That's not safe for you. It's not safe at all. It's a dangerous condition. Again, we look at that verse, verse 32, where it says, you are not, sorry, verse 34, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And you may be like this scribe and know the law of God off by heart and you may have been in a Christian home. Your parents are Christians. Your spouse is a Christian. Your children, your siblings are Christians. Your cat, your dog is a Christian. Who knows? It's a joke. And you may be a truth seeker. And you may know that the importance of loving God is far more important than anything else in the world. But watch out. Because if you're only near the kingdom and you're not in, that means you're completely out and that is dangerous. You're camping outside the fence. Don't get too comfortable. Why? You're not protected from the savage wolves. The scavenging eagles are hovering above your heads. During a great flood, a man may be so near the ark, 
But he didn't get in. He completely drowned. Lot's wife, she nearly escaped the judgment of God and she looked back and she turned into a pillar of salt. There are masses of lost souls, sadly, in hell right now who came so close to the outskirts of the kingdom of God. Their feet were touching the borderline of the kingdom. Their toes were an inch away from entering into the kingdom. All they needed is just a nudge, a push. They came so near the heavenly fence, they could smell the aroma of the roses around the kingdom, in the kingdom. The gates of heaven swung open for them so majestically. And as, as they stood by the gates, they even saw multitudes of people passing by them and rushing into the kingdom. And they, and they heard them weeping over their sins and, and again heard them celebrating the feast of forgiveness. And I saw the smiles on their faces, but yet they stood still. And they refused to enter. And so they sunk into the eternal hell fire. Billions of men and women who are in torment in hell were not far from the kingdom. And many of them heard sound preaching. They're good hearers. Their seats in a, in a church are rarely empty. They don't fall asleep as they hear messages. And even if you ask him, why do you come and hear sound preaching? They would say to you, oh, we love hearing the good gospel. We don't like the watered down gospel. And God showered them with the truth. The light of the gospel shone onto their eyeballs. The invitation to come to, to Christ for forgiveness of sins thundered into their ears. Oh, how close they were to be saved. And as they stood there, though, their noses were squeezed by, by, the, by the, the gates of heaven as it slammed shut before their faces. How dangerous to be in this proximity and yet never enter into the kingdom. Because if you slip into hell, as you are so close, your conscience will haunt you and will torment you with endless regrets. Friend, if you're one of those, and if you would hear the conscience of those who were so near the kingdom and are in hell right now, you would hear them say, oh, how many times my spouse warned me. You've got to let go of your self-dependence. And they entreated me, place your trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation. Oh, why did I continue in my ways? And others yet would say, oh, how many times I, I saw the tears in my mom's eyes every time she pleaded with me, son, repent, son, lay hold of Christ. Why did I get angry and hard in my heart? Oh, my, my insanity, my madness. I heard the cry of my father. I saw his tears crawling in his eyes. I felt the pain in his heart because of my stubbornness. Why? Why or oh why did I cling to my self-righteousness? I wasn't far from the kingdom, but now I'm lost. And yet others would say, the pastor founded the gospel. God brought understanding to my mind that I'm in a desperate need for a savior. I was so close, one inch away from completely being forgiven. 
Why did I refuse to look upon Christ? And why did I reject him? Conscience will torment those who are in hell who were so near the kingdom. And they're going to realize that to be cast into hell while you are so near, your eternal condition will not be any better than those who are even furthest away from the kingdom. You're not safe. How important is it then to know what this scribe should have done to enter the kingdom? How to enter the kingdom? Why is he only near but not in the kingdom? And we come to the third point, not in. So not far and not safe but not in. Now, we don't know what happened to this scribe after this conversation with Christ. Did he become a follower of Jesus? Perhaps, we don't know. But what we know that he wasn't in. Why was he not in? And I want to observe why he wasn't in, not in so much to check whether I'm saved or not, but to see how to be in. How? What should he have done? So let's have a look. Let's have some extra observations. Now, this scribe was purely intellectual. Just big head and a small heart. There are lots of people like that, right? So long as they know the truth in their head, that's all right. That's all that matters. Let's have a look again in verse 32, where he says, right teacher. He was only about what is right and wrong. Again, he says, you truly stated. To him, religion is just about truth and error. That's all it is. And even when Jesus looked at him, Jesus, it says, he saw that he had answered intelligently, intellectually. This man is just a theorist. He loves theories. You know, so many people love to engage in biblical doctrines and they try to extract the most profound and hardest uh, terms and try to memorize and understand it. And those passages in the Bible, uh, especially the most complex ones, I've had discussions with people like them who love to know the mystery behind the seven seals of Revelation or the four animals in the end times and all the rest of it. And they enjoy it like enjoying resolving a, a puzzle, like playing a chess game. That's all it is to them. And they, they view the scripture like watching a documentary of um, some ancient civilization. It stimulates their thinking. Religion to them is just uh, about cognitive exercise. Just like this Scribe's question, it stopped at his mental awareness of the truth and never gone beyond that. And once his intellect was satisfied that Jesus basically gave him the right answer, it stopped, he stopped at his track. The scribe was satisfied when his intellect was satisfied and he stopped there. What should he have done? Let me prove to you that he was only intellectual in a way to help you to know how to get into the kingdom. And we'll finish here. This scribe should have asked Jesus three questions if he would have entered into the kingdom. Three questions. Number one, He should have asked, have I kept the law? He never asked this question. He basically said, well, teacher, you said the truth. There is no doubt about it. Very good, Jesus. I agree with you that the greatest command is to love God with all your heart. And that is a sum and total of the law. Now let's go home. And that's terrible. 
That's terrible. Why? Because the law demands that you fulfill it. Have you fulfilled the law? Have you loved God with all your heart, understanding and strength and your neighbor as yourself? Have you done that? Oh, I'm trying to. No, the command is not that you shall try. You shall do. You shall love. And that's why the scribe is outside of the kingdom. It's just head knowledge. He doesn't personalize it. He doesn't ask, have I obeyed all that the law commands me to do? He says, Jesus, you've just proven that I'm right and everyone else is wrong. And he's okay with that. No. No. Friend, the law of God is given not so much only so that we would seek it, but so that we would obey it. must not just agree with the law. We must abide by the law. Have you kept the law? Wes, but you might say, but who can keep the whole law of God? That's the whole point. That's the whole point. Because this man, he never asked this question, have I kept the law? He never realized that he actually broke in the law. Do you get this? Because if he did, he would have asked the second question. Again, we're taking you through the steps of how to enter the kingdom. Number one, have you kept the law? Number two, what must I do to be saved? He never asked this question. Why? Well, he doesn't show any sign of brokenness, no sign of guilt. There is no sense of failure. He wasn't crushed under the weight of the law. He doesn't realize that the law condemns him. That he has fallen short of the glory of God. He never asked, what should I do? I've broken the law. I don't love God with all my heart, my mind, my understanding, my strength. I don't love my neighbor as myself. He never asked these questions. He never says, oh, my guilt is great. My punishment is severe. What should I do? This law that I, that I know, I must keep. Because I fail to keep it, it condemns me. I stand charged guilty in the sight of God. How can I escape the wrath to come? He never asked this question. That's why he's outside of the kingdom. And the third, and the most important question of them all, Jesus, would you save me? Never ask that question. Well done, Jesus. Let's move on. Never ask them, would you save me, Jesus? Why? How come? He doesn't realize that the one who's standing an arm's length away from him is the very Son of God who alone is able to save. Who is this Jesus Christ that this scribe was face to face with? John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. He's a resurrection and life. John 10, 9, I am the door. He's the door of the kingdom. And then he says, if anyone enters through me, he will be saved. He says, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger and he who believes in me will never thirst. Yet this scribe, even in his most hopeless and helpless state. If, if he just, had he realized what the scripture says about Jesus, that he's a wonderful counsel, mighty God, eternal father, prince of peace, the lamb of God that takes the sin of the world. 
Uh, he would have thrown his face to the dust before Jesus and he would have cried out to Christ saying, I beg you, I am lost, save me. He has no idea why Jesus has come. He doesn't know like it says in Luke 19, 10, where Jesus says, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Galatians 4 verse 4, it says about Jesus that he was born under the law so that he might redeem those who were under the law. Who are those that are under the law? It is those who know that they are condemned by the law, crushed by the law. Jesus came to redeem those who were cursed by the law by becoming cursed for them. Had he known that this son of God is only but few days away from placing himself on a tree voluntarily to bear the sins of all those that would believe in him, he would have cried out and pleaded with him, saying, would you redeem me? The law of God has condemned me. I beg you, have mercy on me. The bottom line is, if this scribe realized who Jesus is and what he has done, he would have exercised living faith. That's how you enter the kingdom, exercising living faith in Christ. And I love how the Puritans explain what living faith is and try to make it simple for you. Basically, living faith is the casting of the soul upon the arms of Jesus. The fleeing from the wrath by hiding in the wounds of Christ. It is looking unto Christ, coming to Christ, resting in Christ, cleaving, trusting, holding on to Christ. Giving all your burden and guilt and all of your sin over to Christ. Why? Scripture tells us that Christ is the end of the law to everyone who believes. Friend, I call upon you to believe in Christ so that you would enter into the kingdom. What would it profit you if you gain the whole world and you still remain outside of the kingdom? Had he believed in Christ, he would have come into the kingdom. I love the song that says, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Saviour, or I die. That is the end of the law. That is the purpose of the law. As we come... To the end of the message, brothers, sisters, I have a word of application to all of you who are in the kingdom. How many of us have unsaved loved ones, whether fathers, children, or friends, neighbors? Do we settle for the fact that they're just generally good, obedient people, good citizens? Do we, do we say, well, oh, my, my spouse respects me and I'm glad about that. My, my children are cute and, and they care about me. I said, I don't want to rock the boat too much. Do we settle for the fact as we observe people around us that they are near the kingdom? And so therefore, we justify why we don't share the gospel with them. What would happen, brothers and sisters, if we fail to be the mouthpiece of God? The only result of this, if they don't hear the gospel preached to them, is that we will see them sinking into the bottomless pit of hell as we stand silent in the name of that they are near the kingdom. But we've seen in this this message 
that it's not enough to be near the kingdom. And so, brothers, I urge you, let us reach out. Let us grab onto them and beg them and plead with them. Doctrinate them and tell them it is not enough to be near the kingdom. You've got to come all the way to Christ and enter the kingdom of God through Jesus. Brothers, let us have the heart of Paul such that not until we see them in the kingdom, no matter how much they they help us around the house or how regular they come to church or Bible reading, if they are not in the kingdom. Let me quote you the last passage in the scripture and I promise for today. Let us be like Paul who said in Romans 9, And verse 2 and 3, it says, in fact, the start from 1, it says, I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed. And he explains what that means. He says, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren. Meaning I have deep, relentless grief, anguish for those who are near the kingdom. Those blood relatives that are near the kingdom. That if it would cost me to be separated from Christ so that they would be In the kingdom, I would do so. That is mind-boggling. Let us have this heart of Paul. Brothers, if God calls us to go into the highways and the byways and compel all sinners, whether far or near, to come and be part of the kingdom, how much all the more those who are so near the kingdom and we see them at home, or at work. Brothers, I urge you, and I do want to remind you, this hour is not the hour of rest. Praise God, we have always rest in Jesus, but our physical, external rest, let us leave that for eternity to come. Now is the time to work. Now is the time to labor. Now is the time to call upon people, even if we throw our bodies before them, that we would plead with them to come to Christ and help them to know to be near the kingdom is not safe. They've got to be in the kingdom. Say this to your children, to your spouses, to the loved ones around you, until... All those that are chosen by God that you know that are near the kingdom would magnify the name of Christ to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, there are those among us, Lord, who heard this message loud and clear and yet they're not in the kingdom. God, it is only by your power and might and strength man is to be saved. And so we put them before you this morning. Lord, we, as we plead with them to come to saving faith and yet we know at the same time they cannot move one inch even closer, let alone to be in the kingdom unless you grant them this faith. So God, we pray that you would grant him faith to be saved. And Father, we who are your chosen children are in the kingdom. Would you kindle a fresh passion and zeal in our hearts, Lord, for your son's name to be so magnified that his name would be in our lips and that there will be fire in our bones like Jeremiah said. Now we would go by the boldness of Christ. We share his name 
with his dying men and women until his name is magnified in their hearts because that is your pleasure, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.